Hello and welcome back to the Rock of the Week, the only show about rocks that manages to feel shorter than it actually is. Today we're talking about one of my favorites as you can probably tell by how many specimens I have here in front of me, and that's gypsum, specifically selenite, which is the fancy name for gypsum in crystal form. And yes, this is all the same mineral right in front of me, minus a few impurities that might color these guys orange or some sand that acts as cement for these desert roses. So gypsum itself is a pretty simple mineral, usually forming as massive white veins or inclusions in rock like this, but if the conditions are right, it can form all kinds of crystals. By default, gypsum is usually white or transparent like this, but inclusions like iron oxide or other clay minerals can color it orange, yellow, or even green at times. So the crystal people watching might recognize this right here as something called satin spar, and it has some pretty cool optical or light banding properties. For example, this effect right here is called chatoyancy or cat's eye sheen because the thin strip of light that gets reflected off the crystal sort of looks like a cat eye. Oh wait, does that look familiar? Look, it's a cat eye. Oh no? Okay. So this kind of selenite is made of very thin needle-like crystals that allow light to pass through them without actually absorbing them. So an image on one side will come out the same on the other side. And this is actually the same fiber optic properties that a lot of internet services run on. These needle-like crystals can form in a lot of different ways. For example, this one right here from Australia, which has these thin white crystals radiating out in clumps, or this other one from Australia, which is just growing out of a base. Some of my favorites are these crystals that seem to split into two identical ones. This is called twinning, and it can come up with some pretty cool shapes, like for example this one, which is called a fishtail or a swallowtail. Twinning happens when a crystal has a so-called accident, and it splits into two across a straight line. <laughs> Mikey, what if we told you about twinning? I'm sorry, it was an accident. <laughs> Here I have another example that shows how this effect can spread across multiple crystals. Here we have the straight line that the twinning happens on, and on either side we have almost identical crystals. Another cool formation is the hourglass, and this happens when the twinning occurs over a horizontal plane versus a vertical plane. All these types of selenite form when mineral-rich water deposits tiny little particles which pile up and form these bigger pieces. No, don't leave me. Don't let go. I can't. I'm literally evaporating. Goodbye. I'll get more into why crystals form in these shapes later, but this is actually how the biggest crystals in the world form deep in a cave in Nica, Mexico. Some of them measure over 10 meters long, but the cave gets so hot that explorers have to wear special cooling suits in order to check them out. So gypsum in rock form is found and mined pretty much everywhere, but I mean, rock gypsum is kind of lame, right? Crystalline selenite is pretty common as well, and this big one, for example, comes from Morocco. Some other big sources are Mexico, which is actually where this giant clump of desert roses came from, Nova Scotia, which is where you get these cool orange crystals, other places around the USA, France, and England, and also the prairies in Canada, which I didn't expect to come out with such cool crystals. Selenite is almost always a product of evaporation, and the best place to find good crystals is near mineral-rich lake beds or springs. The hourglass crystals I mentioned earlier are usually found in an ancient lake bed in Oklahoma, however this one here came from Australia. Another example is the very popular desert rose formation. This happens when sharp blades of gypsum get rolled around in wet sand and eventually form clumps. Now it might be hard to believe that this is all the same stuff, but once you look beyond the thin layer of quartz sand you can see that it's all the same stuff. The white material you'll often see on the edges of the blades are just regular gypsum that have been dehydrated and turned all powdery, much like the gypsum in drywall. You can also find desert roses in the lake beds of Oklahoma, as well as around the Sahara Desert near Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya. This one right here came from Algeria, although it's not exactly a desert rose. Pretty cool though. And sometimes the desert roses can almost grow their own crystals, like this one right here from Manitoba. It's almost like the desert rose in the middle acts as sort of a matrix from which the crystals can grow from. This one's probably my favorite of the bunch. And finally, we have these orangey crystals. These ones here come from a lake bed in Australia that produces a ton of these pieces covered in beautiful, tiny needle-like crystals. And this one in Poland formed as layers of water-soluble material got washed away and then the crystals got deposited inside them. What I think is really cool about this one though is how the color of the crystals seem to get darker the further down you go. This probably has to do with the fact that as these layers of sediment that got washed away to create these pockets were formed, they had different amounts of iron oxide. As the water washed away, these pockets probably had some iron dust left over which these crystals got covered in. Or maybe it gets darker the further up you go. 
So as you can see, selenite can come in a ton of different shapes. But what actually causes this? To find out, we need to look at the individual units that make up every selenite crystal. And that is a hydrous calcium sulfate. That might sound confusing at first, but it's really just a calcium atom bound to a sulfate molecule, which is just one sulfur surrounded by four oxygens, as well as two water molecules, and that's just H2O. The most important component when it comes to crystal making here is the calcium, because calcium is a really reactive element. Now even though it's surrounded by all of its friends here, it still feels lonely and wants more. So what ends up happening is it grabs onto other sulfate and water molecules in the area, and only then does it feel complete. Some of these other molecules might already be bonded to another atom of calcium, and so they start piling up. Once you get a few of these, you end up getting the most basic crystal unit known as a pseudo-rhombohedron right here, which looks like a sort of wonky rectangular prism. This shape is common in other minerals in the monoclinic crystal system, and you might remember this from the biotype video. Anyway, as these units start piling up, you'll see that selenite likes to form in sort of one-dimensional shapes, and it becomes clear how these long, thin crystals form. But also, if conditions like humidity, heat, and pressure are just right, you'll end up getting these more chunky, three-dimensional crystals. We often take for granted how strange of a substance water really is because it's got a huge influence on how these crystals form. Not only is selenite often a product of evaporation, but water is literally baked into the formula and helps retain the shape of the crystals. I already showed off these really nice pseudorhombohedrons, but I wanted to show this one off because it shows how this one same shape can occur across an entire piece. Here's another way selenite forms that I haven't mentioned yet. This gets called ram's horn, and that's because it curls up like, you guessed it, a banana. This is a really unique way of forming, and it happens when dry porous rock allows tiny amounts of water to gradually grow the crystal. The reason it curls like this is because the rate of the water flow tends to fluctuate, and you end up getting some pretty wild shapes. It also helps that the crystal usually originates from one point, unlike all these other ones that usually form all at once. Anyway, selenite is a pretty lightweight and fragile mineral coming in at a 2 on the Mohs scale. That means that it can be scratched by a fingernail, and I'll just quickly demonstrate that here with a lower quality piece because I don't want to hurt these nicer ones. But yeah, there you go. Pretty fragile. Now my finger's all covered in white dust. It's actually one of the softest minerals out there, only being harder than some clay minerals like talc. As for specific gravity, it comes in at around a 2.3, which means it's about 2.3 times heavier than an amount of water the same shape and size. It's also a bit sensitive to sunlight, and prolonged exposure will sort of dull the crystal faces. And don't go taste testing your gypsum samples because it is slightly water soluble. It's not like a drop of water is going to start violently fizzling away at the surface like a drop of acid on limestone, I just don't think encouraging rock licking on the internet is such a good idea. Okay, maybe just one lick. Selenite is basically just gypsum that looks cool, and its only real use is being cool looking. However, gypsum in rock form has a lot of uses, for example drywall. You might be wondering why drywall is even made out of gypsum and not wood or concrete or some other kind of rock, and I was wondering the same thing. But as it turns out, gypsum actually has some pretty favorable properties. For example, it's lightweight and easy to cut, while still being pretty strong. It's also resistant to fire, which as you might imagine, is a really important property if it's being used in homes. I don't believe you. Dude, it's a rock. Why would it be flammable? I think we have to test this out ourselves. No, we don't have to test it out. They we do. They need to see proof. They can literally just Google it. It would be it. way cooler if we tried it out ourselves. Well, guess what? I have the drywall here. What are you going to do? This is going to end badly. All right, here I have a piece of wood and a piece of drywall, about the same size. We're going to put them on the fire and see which one lasts longer. I think I know which one it's going to be, but I really want to burn something. Drywall and wood. Here I have the piece of wood and the piece of drywall. So first glance, they look pretty pretty beat up. The wood in particular has cracks going down pretty much the whole way. Uh, the drywall has a bit of a crack there, but it looks like most of the damage is on the surface where the, uh, the paper was. Now before the fire, I can never break this, but it just crumbles now. I would not want this to be my walls. And the drywall, um, oh. So yeah, it looks like the drywall has lost a bit of its strength. All right, so who do you think won? Let me know in the comments. Another major use for gypsum is making plaster, particularly a type called plaster of Paris. This is handy for things like patchwork and casting, and you can buy it at pretty much any hardware or home improvement store. 
However, before the gypsum gets used in it, it has to go through a process called calcination, which involves burning it and dehydrating it. Did someone say burning? Oh my gosh, no! All right, so here I have these hot coals from the previous experiment. And what I want to try to do is I want to see if I can calcinify this piece of gypsum that I was scratching earlier. So we're just going to throw it in here, see what happens. So here we have the aluminum foil with the gypsum in it. And for the British people, that's uh, the aluminium foil. Oh, wow. Okay, this is actually kind of cool. So there you go. And it just sort of opens up like uh, almost like a book of mica or something, but it's completely opaque now. There's at least a bit of translucence before. So we have completely evaporated all the water that once helped make up this gypsum. I guess this also shows how selenite forms in layers, much like other minerals in the monoclinic system. So that's actually kind of cool. There's another kind of gypsum that I haven't mentioned yet, and it's called alabaster. It's been used for thousands of years for sculpting, and it's basically just regular rock gypsum, just with finer grains. The softness makes it really easy to work with, but it can be a bit limiting because of how fragile it is. Now unfortunately, I couldn't find any statues to smash, so let's move on to some fun facts. So first of all, what kind of name is gypsum anyway? Well the answer is a bit underwhelming, but it makes sense. The word gypsum is derived from the Greek word gypsos, which literally means plaster. But what about selenite? I mean, if you're a chemist, you might be scratching your head because selenite usually refers to a chemical that contains the element selenium, like for example, sodium selenite, which has nothing to do with the selenite crystals I have here. But the origin comes way before the element selenium was even discovered, and once again we're going back to ancient Greece, to Selene, the goddess of the moon. Selenite and the moon were often linked together because of their natural beauty and their ability to somewhat glow. Interestingly, the mineral selenite was named in 1747, 70 years before the element selenium was discovered in 1817. And did you know that gypsum was actually used to mimic snow in the early days of Hollywood? It actually makes sense because the minerals selenite and ice, yes, ice is a mineral, are both transparent and thin crystal minerals. I feel like it would have been a nightmare to clean up though. And finally, the use of gypsum as a building material dates back over 7,000 years to the ancient Egyptians, who would use it to make plasters similar to the stuff we use today. They would also use it in more decorative or symbolical ways, and Cleopatra was even believed to drink from a gypsum cup. Gypsum might have been pretty fragile on its own, but when mixed with the right materials, it truly does stand the test of time. And on that philosophical note, we've made it to the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching, and I really hope you learned something new today. Make sure to like and subscribe, and tell me in the comments down below what mineral you think I should cover next. That's all for today. Happy collecting, everyone.